when I first started uh, preparing this presentation, it was about, I was going through this phase where I was watching just a million short films. Like literally I watch hundreds of them a day. I don't watch them all the way through, you know, beginning to end, but I lo I'm looking for common themes um, in the movies that are good for edit stock or not good for edit stock. Like let me just give you an example because this was hot in the chat list from the webinar yesterday, yesterday morning. So I don't take movies that are two people talking in a room. That's it, like if, especially if it's an, appoint, an apartment. That's just no way. Um, I don't take movies if every single shot is on sticks. I just don't, you know, because it's like it, there needs to be more, you know, more creativity. So, you know, when you watch a lot of things, you start to see the pattern in those things. And, you, you know, because I'm not attached to any of these short films until I get them, right? So I'm just very quickly judging them. It's the same thing actually with, with editing. I watch a lot of the same scenes cut over and over and over again. And you know what it feels like to me? It's like when a rock climber is about to climb up a, a wall. Well, the first time you go, you just have no idea, right? But you watch 25 people go, and you just sort of say like, yeah, yeah, that's the hold that everyone has a problem with, right? This is the spot. So there, there are spots um, where people get stuck. and so. I was on this quest to write a presentation that was all about where people get stuck in short films. Instead, I found something so much more interesting that I can't wait to share it with you all. I'm so excited about this. I uh, brought a laser pointer. I bought a laser pointer. <laughs> it can do that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, so editing is gonna change in a big way. It's gonna change in a big data way. I know, see that? I picked that transition there. This is the movie Austin Powers. Rather, this is um, the movie, if you were to take every single frame of it and stretch it from the bottom to the top of the screen and left to right chronologically, that's the entire movie. That's pretty cool, right? This is a thing called a movie barcode. Movie barcode is a Tumblr account that I stumbled across. It's free, it's anonymous. The person who made, I try to reach out to them, there is, they, there's no response. But, uh, but I love their work, and I just want to show you a little bit more about this graph. This is the same movie. Now I'm just going to use my laser pointer. <laughs> so this is the movie stretched, you know, every frame, and then uh, right to left, that's how long the movie is. The distance between these lines, like see that little line right there? The distance between those lines tells you about how long this has been going on. And that's important when you get to an animated short film like this one, where the bars are very, narrow, uh, very wide. And they're very wide because the movie is three minutes long. So again, movie barcodes, very cool. It's very cool when you compare a bunch of movies that may or may not have anything to do with each other. You know, maybe it's just kind of cool to see, you know, more than just one, right, a bunch. Because from a bunch, we can start getting more specific information. Like, for example, these are all James Bond movies. How did James Bond change between 1960 and 2015? It's always been dark, but apparently they added gold. Gold is the new thing. It's cool to see a movie graphed like this, um, but the information isn't very relevant. But it's so cool. But it's so cool. <laughs> so cool that this, I dumped the other presentation for this. This is one of my favorite movies, The Lord of the Rings, and it's a little bit different. He averaged out the pinstripes. So instead of being every frame uh, pulled all the way to the top, it's um, the average of everything that happens in that frame stretched out. So it's a very slight difference, but it makes for better throw pillows. <laughs> so if anyone wants to buy me one of these, you, you know, come see me after the show. Buy two, 50% off. That's right. <laughs> Keep one for yourself. But here's the main point of my talk tonight. All of a sudden, you know, we're keeping track of data, right? More and more and more, we're keeping track of everything. And all that data is, really, when you break it down, it's just a measurement of something. That's it, it's just a measurement. It's not good, it's not bad. It has no thought, it has no meaning, 
It's just, we just count, right? What's important, though, is what you do with the data, right? Can we try to discern something important out of that data? And for us, specifically as filmmakers, you know, what does this signal tell us? So that's what I mean by the signal in the noise. And what I'm here to try to convince you is that there is a signal in the noise of creativity, specifically in movies. So in the, in, uh, there is a theoretical physicist who I'm not sure if he is still with us. His name is Barry Salt. He was born in Australia in 1930, and he holds a PhD in theoretical physics and yet teaches classes at the Royal Academy of Art in London, or did, at least until 2014. So he took a scientific approach to editing, specific, well, to filmmaking in general, but um, you know, tonight we're gonna talk about editing because that's all I know anything about. <laughs> so Barry took, um, he took 35 movies and counted every dialogue seen in them for all sorts of different measurements. He counted like how many shots are J cuts versus L cuts, how many are, have an over, you know, how many uh, frames between lines, what camera angles did you use. He counted, you know, the average shot length, the number of reaction shots, and he tracked these films that were made between 1933 and 2014, and I wanna share with you first some of his findings. First of all, most cuts were made within six frames of the first person stopping to talk and the next person starting to talk. Does that make sense, whether it's J or an L? The average cut was pretty much a straight cut. It was a little bit different, a little bit different than that. And there are slightly more L cuts than J cuts, which I think is interesting. There are, as my laser points out, 16% of the time these films used J, uh, L cuts, and that's an L. And <laughs> I'm really excited by this thing. 6% of the time, it's a J cut. But here's where things get a little weird, slightly weird. When you do an L cut, and so this is the average length of an L cut. Most of the time it's right, it's zero frames, which is, you know, you don't even count that in, as an L, right? You don't even count that as an L. But look, th so then within one frame is 9% of the time, within two frames, 15, and it drops off. But when you do a J cut, you're much more likely to have a longer overlap. Interesting insight. Still not very important. <laughs> But an interesting insight nonetheless. There's more to this, though, about J and L cuts. When you um, compare older movies to more modern movies, they have more J cuts. So what happened? Was there some sort of meeting of the minds where all the editors sat in a room and said, we're done with this L cut thing? <laughs> no, you know, obviously not. So there is some sort of uh, change going on. And I'll give you one example of a change. I think there's a slide for it coming up, but I, I feel it right now. There are more reaction shots in dialogue scenes now, too, by 22%. Why is that? So Barry guesses that it's because there's more coverage. Oh, uh, so, you know, before you used to really plan out a reaction shot, and now we just shoot everything and see if we want it in. Actually, one more thing I want to point out about the L cut, so we need both. We need both the artist and the um, researcher to help us figure out why these things matter. So for example, in the L cut, Barry Salt lists in his um, report that he thinks L cuts are used because that way you can speed up the dialogue by showing the person's reaction that we're going to without needing the empty space in between. And that's true, and I felt that way up until this weekend when I heard uh, another editor at the editor's retreat say that no, the reason is because when you hear something, you turn around and wanna see it. So we needed both the researcher to count this up, but we also needed the artist to explain to us why, and this gives us some, some more insight into you know, our own craft. Here's another insight into our own craft. Um, 
Both of these movies, both edited by Sandra Adir, have more J cuts than L's. Weird, right? The, the trend is that there's more L's than J's. So Sandra did this wrong. <laughs> I'm going to tell the Oscar committee that Boyhood was edited poorly and that they should reconsider their nomination. But it, what it does here is give us an insight into an editor's style. All of a sudden, we can measure style, right? Sandra Deer's style is more J cuts. That's at least one facet of it. Another facet of style might not be the editors, but the directors. So these two movies, Signs and the Sixth Sense, both edited by different direct, uh, sorry, different editors, but the same director. And the space between the cuts, between the words, is the same in both movies on average. So what does that mean? Is that because the editors both had the same internal clock? Or is it because the director had an internal clock? And what's interesting is you wouldn't necessarily know this about yourself um, because you can't measure something before you do it, right? So we can sort of look back. Um, before I go into the, the next slide's gonna, everyone in this room is gonna be like the Maxwell tape guy, you know, back. I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna have to play the next slide twice. But before we do, I wanna give one big takeaway that I've said like 75 times this weekend, so sorry, Patrick, you've heard this before. Um, this is a book called The Art of Learning. Josh Waitkins, uh, if you've seen the movie Searching for Bobby Fischer, he's that kid. His dad was a sports writer and wrote the screenplay and Josh became very famous. He was the um, 18 and under world champion for a while in chess, and then he got too famous, quit, took up Tai Chi to be in silence and solitude, and decided to start competing in that too, in a totally foreign sport that he had never heard of before, and he became the world champion of that as well. So how can he do this? One of, um, one of the things he mentioned is you take the, the way to practice is you take a very large idea and you break it down into smaller and smaller and smaller ideas so that you can practice the smaller and smaller ideas. Um, an example would be, well, I'll, I'll get to an example in a second. Um, I'm gonna come back to this. Okay, everyone hold on to your seats, buckle up. I'm gonna introduce uh, to you guys now. This is a kid Okay, yeah, so I went to um, a conference called SELECT, which is an international body of film teachers. It was in uh, Columbia College in Chicago. They played this video. One of the presentations I saw played this video, and I was on the floor. And this person did it as it was in passing, okay? So um, the, the person who created this app that we're about to see um, did this as a senior project also at the London Royal Academy of Art, um, but he is a designer and, div and um, programmer, not a filmmaker. This is one of many projects that they made. Okay, this is called Cinemetrics, um, and it's about measuring and visualizing movie data in order to reveal the characteristics of a film and to create a visual, what he calls, a movie fingerprint for them. Here we go.
we can, if we have time at the end, I'm going to play the video again, but I'm going to explain the charts um, because I rewatched this about 100 times to make sure I fully appreciated everything that's going on in these charts. So first of all, the size of the circle is the duration of the film. It's always start, end. But notice that the original Solaris is a longer movie than the remake, right? Next, the motion here that you see, that is anything happening in the frame. It's not how many cuts there are. So for example, if something ran across the frame, like an animal, but it was all one shot, that bar would move. Next, the colors here are the, are right now we're looking at an average of the colors in the whole movie. But each slice is a chapter. He made this uh, from DVDs. So another overlay that you saw earlier was what the colors for each chapter were, which is why you had a more, uh, a different look. What's really cool about this is you have such a much better way to compare movies than those movie barcodes we were looking at earlier. For example, these are both movies about outer space, but one of them is an action movie. So what did we learn about movies from outer space? Maybe we learned that they're all the same colors and they're all about the same length, but that you can make one that's action and one that's you know 2001 Space Odyssey. What about all movies by the same director? I think this is a, an interesting perspective on Wes Anderson. You know, and Wes Anderson, isn't necessarily trying to do this. This is just what came out of them, right? But think of, the, think of what happens when your director comes to you and says, I wanna make a movie that's like a Wes Anderson movie. Now you can say like, well, what does that mean? You know, what do you mean specifically? Or you can go research a particular genre if you're a director and you wanna bend the genre. Or if, um, you know, there, there are a lot of ways, you know, we need to ask ourselves first, you know, what's in a movie before we can ask ourselves, how do I make a unique movie or a different movie or, you know, a special movie? So, base, so, uh, so baseball. So film editing is heading for its, um, for its money ball moment. If any of you guys have read that book, I, I strongly suggest it. Where well, we're going to start using um, actually important, you know, creative metadata, not just what's seen in take, but also how about some of these statistics? I'm not sure I can zoom in, but I'm gonna just read some of these off the screen to you. We can track number of words per minute, or how, many, how often a character's face is on screen, or how many shots per minute, or the average, cut, the average shot length. Um, we can measure positive and negative language. I don't know what that means exactly. Philip can probably tell us. No? Okay. Sentiment. Sentiment. Well, that's what I thought, but I don't know how a computer can do that, but if it can do that, it can, that's amazing. So, you know, we might be able to, and actually uh, Michael Thomas made a great point, how amazing would this be if you had in Creative Cloud a panel that showed your movie's movie uh, um, Cinemetrics fingerprint and you could kind of judge as you're going along. The way I see it now, the way that we teach people how to edit, we give them all the dailies to something and then we say, go edit this, and then we, and then we critique it and from the critique, they pick up some information. And from the experience, they pick up some information. But that's not really any different than your foreign language teacher handing you a book and saying, read this Spanish or read this Japanese. And you just, just sit there till you figure it out. And so you just sit there and try and try and try. And then when you say, I think it says this, they come back to you and say, well, you got one word right. right? And now we're like anchored, like, ah, I got that one. But we can do this differently. We can do this in a way where we take the big task of editing and boil it down into smaller bits. Just the same way we do with baseball, right? Like if I, I play outfield, I'm a left fielder. Um, I'm just kidding, I'm a right fielder. But if I tell anyone I'm a right fielder, they judge me. <laughs> uh, I'm, a, I'm a right fielder. And you know, we take fly balls for practice. But you know, we don't just say go out and play baseball to get better. So I'm going to give you guys an example of a puzzle. And we're going to start with a bit of data. Wide shots are most likely to be used by editors when a shot contains big physical actions. Examples include when an actor stands up or when a ball is thrown across the room. Now, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm not saying that's a good cut, a bad cut, or always the case. I'm saying that. 
the data shows from studying lots of movies that most of the time that editors use wide shots, a big action happens. Okay, so now I'm gonna give you a puzzle. I'm gonna play an unedited shot from the film Handicap John. I want you to pick the four spots where an editor is most likely to use this wide shot, where they're most likely. That's the key, and I want you to pick four. Here it comes. Camera speeds. Marker. Set and action. <gasps> So how was it? <laughs> what? No, nothing. Hey, uh, it was good. Fine. Uh, uh, nothing to report. You all right, John? Yeah. Why did you think something happened? Well, you're sweating profusely, and your left eye keeps switching. Uh, no. Everything was great. Of course. What the hell? Did you see that? Oh God. Are they heading to the bathroom? Dude, what the hell kind of dump did you leave them in there? I mean. I've heard of giant dumps before, but this is ridiculous. Okay, okay. I know, I know, I'm sorry, this is gonna sound really bad, but um ja, I was in there in the and then Jonas was coming and he was crazy. He was like beating down the door. I think he fell down in the stall next to me. And you just left him in there? Well, yeah, but it was more complicated than that. Uh, he, he had a weapon. A weapon? Yeah, well, a walker, but it was like a dangerous walker with projectile tennis balls. You just left your handicapped boss laying on the ground? John, what is wrong with you? I didn't know he was handicapped. I just, he was like yelling at me and he's like possessed and he's, I think he's gonna kill me. Dude, I'm dead. Oh. <gasps> <gasps> uh. I'm gonna give you the data one more time and, I, and then I want people to raise their hand just one by one and I know I've got seven minutes so I'll, I'm on it. Um, okay, this is the data, right? Wide shots are most likely to be used when a shot contains big actions. Examples include when an actor stands up or when a ball is thrown across the room. Does anyone wanna take a guess at one of the four spots? Does anyone wanna raise their hand and be brave? Absolutely, right when he walks down the hallway. Does anyone want to take a crack at another spot? When the guy looks out, when he looks over the cubicle wall, right? Okay, two spots. Did you have a spot, ma'am? When they were both together and they were. When they were both together and they were. And they were sort of looking over and they were making all kinds of moves. You could yes, see with their hands. See that, yeah. I'm going to say that is number five because that is a totally legit time to use it, also. Um, and so it's not wrong. Does anyone else? Um, it's not. Does anyone else? Uh, yes, sir. When they first notice the hands moving around the background. When they first, yes, when the stretcher rolls by, right? In the background. Good. Let me just see if I've got, uh, yeah, okay. I think we've got them. Yeah, I think we've got them all. Right? When, they, when he walks down the corridor, when the stretcher rolls by, when he leans over the cubicle wall, and then when he gets up from his chair. Now, I could give that as a, that I could literally play that shot and say click on the four spots where wide shot's most likely to be used. Another way to do it is you give a student um, a cut of something and then have them add good use or bad use to the shot. So here's an example of a student who actually edited this scene and you can see how they might answer this puzzle. <gasps> Oh, how was the dump? What? What dump? Nothing. <laughs> uh, it's, it's fine. Nothing to report. You all right, John? Yes. Why would you think something happened? <laughs> well, you're sweating profusely and your left eye keeps switching. Uh, no. Everything went out smoothly and great, of course. What the hell? Did you see that? Oh, God. Are they heading to the bathroom? Oh. Dude, what the hell kind of dump did you leave them in there? I mean, I've heard of giant dumps before. It's ridiculous. Who's going next? Swap with gas, man. Listen, okay, this is gonna sound really bad, but um, I was in there, and then Janice came in, and he was going crazy, and he was beating on the door, and then I think he slipped and fell in the next stall. You just left him in there. Good, but it was like really complicated because he was uh, he had a weapon. A weapon? Yeah. Uh, it was a walker, but it was a dangerous walker with projectile tennis balls, and 
And you just left your handicap boss laying on the ground, John. What is wrong with you? I didn't know he was handicapped. What was I supposed to do? He was like screaming at me with that voice. You heard him, right? And then he's, I think he's gonna kill me, man. I'm dead. Whoa! Hey. Okay, this cut could have other stuff wrong with it. I'm not saying it's perfect. There could be, some of the, those wide shots could be shorter. Some of the dialogue could be smoother. We could choose different performances. We could use the wide shot more often, right? But that's not what we're doing. When you think back to that baseball example, right? You could have an outfielder who's bad at fly balls and bad at hitting, but you don't make them practice both those things at once. So here, I hope from this puzzle, we all have a much better understanding, a better literacy for what it means to use a wide shot, right? And um, that's what my goal is with this whole project. It's not to make the perfect cut. It's to teach literacy. It's the same thing as your English teacher. That teacher is not trying to teach you to write the perfect book. They're trying to teach you how to write and how to read, right? And that's it. And so, you know, I added these two charts, um, which I've shown at Lafsy Pug before. But just basically the idea is this. Uh, you know, this initial line comes from what I call exposure learning. You just, someone just tells you what it is and you get better at it. For example, we're all now better in this room for using wide shots, whether or not we even needed to practice it necessarily. Just because I said what the wide shot's for, you'll get better, right? This line right here is literacy, right? That's like everyone can achieve that in a fairly short period of time. I think editing is not that, uh, look, I love editing. I think it's a high art. I think everyone can achieve a perfectly suitable uh, level of literacy where they can work. You don't have to be a genius to do it. You don't have to go to college to do it. In fact, funny story about college, uh, we all wonder whether or not you should go to film school, right? But nobody wonders about whether or not you should go to med school. Well, 200 years ago, if you went to a doctor, you had a better chance they'd kill you than save you. We only reached parity about 100 years ago, right, where you had a 50-50 shot at it. And now, you know, no one would ever question it. But cinema, how old is cinema? It's 100 years old. You know, so is going to film school something that people toss back and forth about? Yes, but in the future, it, that will not be the case because we will have much better ways of measuring and, um, you know, of, of teaching people where they'll be literate. Um, also, you'll all get stuck here. That happens to everyone. It's because I would say in editing, there's probably a thousand lessons, maybe a few hundred lessons that you need to learn, like, you know, what a noun is, what a verb is, uh, before you sort of reach literacy. And that just takes a long time to have all those lessons uh, before you get better.